This video has been supported by SOK Battery. Hey folks, do you have a minute to talk about our lord and savior lithium iron phosphate? Because I finally have the ultimate battery for my off-grid solar system. It was just delivered in this innocently looking medium-sized package, but on a bit of an ominous pallet. As a frequent carrier of all the shopping bags at once, I routinely disregard team lift warnings on packages. This thing however, goodness gracious, absolutely space-time bendingly dense. That's why I was tempted to deposit it right away in its final destination, the CNC shed. However, I feel like such a central building block in my solar system deserves a detailed, well-lit video in its honor. So I took it upon myself to carry it up the stairs. To accomplish that, I had to take it out of the box and lift it one step at a time by the handles. Yep, this is a whole integrated battery module inside of a 19-inch server rack mountable enclosure. Oh, not sure if I trust my steel toe safety socks with the 45 kilograms that this thing weighs. I just hope the handles are attached firmly. This powder coated steel sheet metal enclosure is allowed to be that heavy, because it contains 16 prismatic 100 ampere hour lithium iron phosphate cells, as well as a very sophisticated battery management system to keep them safe, balanced and to interface with the outside world. It can not only show you the parameters of each and every cell on its own, or the whole pack together, it also has a repertoire of digital interfaces to coordinate with popular chargers, inverters or just a program running on a computer. For automation and data logging for example. Should the over 5000 watt hours of energy that fit into one of these chunkers be insufficient for somebody, multiple units can be paralleled easily with these dual high current terminals, bust digital communication and individual addressability. A man can dream. This battery was delivered with bolts and shrouds for the main terminals. A rack mounting kit which we might indeed need if I can ever afford another one or two of these on my own. And a handwritten factory test protocol that curiously doesn't seem to mention any temperature or overcurrent tests, so yay, there's something for me to do. I've mentioned these before, but because I'm still getting outraged comments about lithium iron phosphate prices, here are some of the advantages again. These guys can have an insane lifespan depending on how hard and at what temperatures they are used. They will still have at least 80% of their initial capacity after 4 to 8000 cycles. If one doesn't go through a complete cycle every day, these can last for tens of years. They aren't as safe as lead batteries, but much safer than NMC lithium ions, because their typical cell voltage is much further away from the electrolyte breakdown voltage. They are maintenance free and have much better energy density per weight and volume than older battery technologies. And of course you can use all of the specified ampere hours, and not just half of them as is common with lead acid types. The only disadvantage of lithium iron phosphate is that they must not be charged below freezing temperatures, because that's where the lithium ions cannot travel as easily and permanent damage can occur. Still, I think at the moment this is the most desirable battery technology for solar power storage. The prices are pretty high, but worth it. In the low cost lithium iron phosphate market segment, i.e. not Victron, not SMA and not SunPower, the SOK brand seems to have a very good reputation. And this must be why. The assembly is exquisitely clean. No weapons of mass destruction are needed to get in here. There is still a reasonable do not disassemble warning on a sticker and in the manual. But I have a feeling that this manufacturer will not ask me to put a disclaimer in the video. Because this is truly a highlight. There are only traceable grade A Ganfeng lithium cells in here. Nothing is glued, nothing is spot welded and most importantly no polyurethane foam. I'd be tempted to call this repair friendly and even though I don't expect the need for a repair, I think it's reassuring because my whole house power is going to depend on this. The 8 prismatic cells in each of these subframes are not exactly mounted with compression. Many cell manufacturers used to recommend that to prevent bloating and ultimately internal delamination. I suppose the 1C charge rate that the BMS allows for these is still considered pretty gentle. So it might not be necessary, but I feel like adding some screws to the side walls of the enclosure to put some squeeze onto these plastic spacers would not be much trouble at all, but potentially give these batteries an even longer life. Hell, it almost seems like they are prepared for it. 
in my official capacity as a copper enjoyer, of course I can't help but notice the beautiful bus bars that they have used in here. They are made from a stack of super thin copper foil that has been welded at both ends. Only under the heatsink do they still have a flexible section. These high quality components give the assembly a lot of immunity against vibration and thermal expansion. I'm 100% on board with their screw everything approach. Only the four temperature sensors mounted on these cross braces are in my opinion a bit too far away from the cells. If there ever is some kind of a sudden thermal emergency that isn't coming from the outside, it will take the BMS quite a while to see it. In this case I would support siliconing the sensors to the laser engraving windows, which expose the cells metal shells directly. Nothing too surprising on the BMS board. It's a low side current sensor and bi-directional switch, just like the ones we've seen before. The battery monitoring, the dis and charge FET control, the cell balancing and a few other nuances are controlled by a Panasonic AN49503A. The interfaces like the front panel operator controls, the RS232 diagnostic and configuration link, and the RS485 and CAN bus connections to other batteries or inverters are handled by an STM32F460 clone. Interestingly, this battery has a pre-charge resistor too that allows you to slowly, carefully trickle some charge into the input capacitance of whatever is connected to it, rather than risking unrestrained short circuit currents to flow briefly. But where is it? I think rather than placing a huge high power resistor like Blue Eddy did, these guys have just hired a current limited switching regulator for the job. No idea if that's really cheaper or better, but we'll see it in action in a moment. That circuit is also used to limit the battery to battery equalization current, when multiple boxes at different states of charge are paralleled. Clever, I like it a lot. The high side is fused with a 125 ampere circuit breaker of last resort. Careful, in a DC application like this, mechanical circuit breakers get a voltage derating. Because a DC arc has no zero crossings, and therefore it doesn't extinguish itself quite so easily. I can't find a data sheet for this one, but it seems to be in spec. Before finishing the reassembly, there is one thing left I'd like to test. The charging below freezing temperatures is a real threat to these beautiful batteries. Many manufacturers just specify a usable 0 to 40 Celsius or so ambient temperature range and are done with it. From a higher quality manufacturer I would expect a bit more protection. Especially if absolute temperature measurements are happening in 4 places in a battery anyway. A positive IM value means charging by the way. And sure enough, we've got a working low temperature charge prevention. Wonderful. Next I'd like to show a few details about the installation and configuration. For that I have to introduce you to my solar charger mains inverter. I haven't found a willing sponsor for a box like this, so I'd like to thank my Patreon subscribers and you guys, who have bravely endured all of the cheesy advertising I've aired recently. You have my gratitude, and you have secured regular deliveries of content and more cheesy advertising throughout the collapse of civilization or whatever is coming next. This is an MPP Solar PIP 11 kW Max for the European market so with a 230 volt output. You guys can decide in the comments below if you want to see a dedicated video about it. Just letting you know that it's probably not going to be any different than the other transformerless inverters we've seen recently. Just more and bigger components. To turn it on safely we get to use the aforementioned so-called pre-charge resistor. For that we flip the breaker power switch, press the recess to reset button and wait until the alarm LED is turned off. This takes a couple of seconds during which the BMS tries to figure out if the output is shorted. If its initial test charge remains for a while, it assumes that whatever is connected has been successfully pre-charged. Hence turning on the real low resistance discharge switch is safe. Now the battery is fully armed and most consumers could just be powered on. Only this particular SOK MPP Solar Dream Team has another trick up its sleeve. If configured correctly these guys can communicate over RS485 with each other. The battery will automatically inform the all-in-one solar system about all of its preferred charge and discharge parameters. The units can share error states improving the system safety. And if you're interested in data logging or automation, you can now read the battery's state of charge from the inverter. So you only have to interface with one device. 
Tada! Here's how I set that up. In the inverters configuration menu, I'm going to point 5, which is battery type. That was delivered with the default setting flooded lead acid batteries. I'm changing that to PYL for pylon tech. That seems to be the pioneer in the server rack battery market and the creator of the pylon tech digital communication protocol that everybody seems to be using now. The pinning of the special RJ45 cable that is needed to connect these two units is described nicely in the user manual of the SOK battery. And they also have pre-made ones for sale, I think. But if within, say, like a minute of plugging in, the inverter still doesn't shut up with its unbearable dying patient in the ER impression, there is a good chance that you need to do one more thing. You have to buy or DIY an RS-232 cable and download a Windows exclusive configuration software from the current connected website. It's called PBMS Tools and in the top right corner it allows you to set the inverter protocol to Pylon 485 or whatever else you need in your setup. And that's it, now my two boxes can communicate and all further configuration is happening automatically. There is another much more advanced tool on the current connected website called SOK Tools. This one gives you a lot more settings like control over the alarm levels, but not the inverter protocol. There we are, the patient is dead but the error disappeared and the battery symbol is flashing. The way it's meant to be apparently. Okay, that concludes the setup. Now it's time for a test drive. A reality check if you will. We've successfully conducted a one day off-grid laboratory experiment in the past. The way I see it there's only one way to top that and that is to finally pull the plug on my whole apartment. For the record, I'm going through all this trouble not just as a response to the latest developments in uh, energy politics. I've been planning to fully transition to solar power ever since adopting that fluke calibrator and its nearly 200 watt standby power consumption. Keeping that thing running 24-7 as it deserves would have been just not economically viable. But now I think I finally can. So in a way this is not reps getting scared by energy crisis fearmongering but a fourth pillar in the Fluke Calibrator Foundation, besides the 10 volt, 10 kilo ohm and 1 ohm transfer standards. The wiring for the real, final installation out here is pretty much in place. But before committing to it, I wanted to do a bit more realistic reliability testing. So I've temporarily set up my loud, hot air spewing power plant in here. And just spliced it into my electrical sub-panel whose lives were disconnected from the main panel elsewhere. For a full-scale balls-to-the-wall load test of the 100 ampere capable 50 volt SOK battery, I'm going to have to draw 5 kilowatt. Luckily, I've just changed my instant tankless electrical water heater to make that possible. The old one was a 21 kilowatt three-phase unit, an absurdly power-hungry beast that pretty much made me afraid of drawing too much hot water from the tap because of the associated electricity cost. The new one is only half as powerful, so it's quite a downgrade. And it can be further throttled to 5 kW with internal dip switches. But let me tell you, warm tap water has never felt that good before, because it's free. I might actually take a shower for once. Of course, the battery can deliver its rated 100 ampere quite easily. And because I went with 70 square millimeter cables for upgradability later, I can hardly detect a hint of heat after one minute of nearly 100 ampere flowing. Excellent, but I wonder what happens if we go too far. First of all, the inverter can and should be configured to never exceed the battery's current limit. As a safety layer and for the convenience of never having to recover from any overcurrent conditions. Failing that, it is possible to overload the battery, making the BMS tap out, enter an error state and to open its discharge MOSFET switch. The inverter makes a perfunctory attempt to gather all of the power from solar only, but my water heater is still running so it can't maintain it. The good news is that the mechanical circuit breaker is not involved in any of this. It really is just the last line of defense against catastrophic failure. So the SOK BMS alone could recover from this situation without human intervention. 
It's questionable if it should, because if something has failed so badly in a system that the BMS had to step in in the first place, it might make things worse if it just decides to flip the lights back on on its own. But yeah, theoretically it should be possible to recover from errors remotely without a human going there to flip a switch. Maybe with a sequence of RS-232 commands. Good, but in my system I'm going to implement a softer current limit elsewhere. And that's all I have to say about the SOK server rack battery. It's damn near perfect. Inside is the best battery type on the market at the moment. Supported by high quality components and a construction that is almost too good for the boring stationary installation that I'm planning here. This is probably the only manufacturer in this category that advertises rightfully with repairability. There is well written and in depth documentation and fast English speaking customer support should the former ever be insufficient. There are American and European distribution partners for an unbureaucratic delivery to your door. The BMS has a lot of smart features for safety, data logging, remote control and coordination of larger modular systems. I'm not aware of any external safety test certificates for this product, but on top of the already pretty safe battery chemistry there are multiple layers of technical safety measures. So the only thing that I worry about is procuring a few more of these for the more or less harsh German winter. In that regard, please use my affiliate link in the description below if you decide to purchase one of these. It would help me out with a small commission without costing you anything extra. And that is all. See you soon.